Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And on this episode we are going to look at a curious case of witchcraft. More specifically, at the curious case of a curse. A witch's curse, which in this case is cast upon somebody who refused the witch's request for assistance. Now, this is quite a popular theme in many old folk tales where the witch might ask somebody for help. Can you spare some change? Can you spare some milk? Can you do a little job for me? And if that request is turned down, it's quite common that the witch will then take revenge in some shape or form. But what is quite special about this tale is that if you choose to believe it, it is supposedly a real-life tale. And we know where it took place. We also know the name of the witch, or the supposed witch, I should say. But I should warn you, this is a tale which has quite a dark ending. It does not end well, but all will be revealed in this episode. Now, this tale was recorded in the 1980s. It takes place much, much earlier than that, but it was recorded in the 1980s by the wonderful Jane Pugh, who I've mentioned a couple of times on this podcast now. The last time was episode 48, when we looked at corpse candles and things. But usually with Jane, we look at her ghost stories. It's probably her ghost stories that she's best known for collecting. This is the first time we're looking at any of her witchier tales, shall we say, which I think are just as fascinating as the ghost stories. Now, to begin at the beginning, this tale takes place close to Llyn Eber near Llan Idlois, which is in modern-day Powys, and it concerns a witch, or certainly a supposed witch, called Bethan Jones. A good, honest Welsh name there, Bethan Jones, the witch from near Llan Idlois, that lovely little market town. And Jane tells us that Beth Ann Jones earned her living by begging, and there were not many refusals as she looked intimidating in every way. And of course, it's not just the way she looks. This crops up in films and books and works of fiction, and in this case, works of fact, about witches, that to refuse them, they might take it personally and they might curse you. Quite a combination, really. Looked intimidating, and if that didn't work, by the way, I might also curse you. Now, it was while begging one day, one morning, at the start of the harvest, that she went to a farm nearby asking for some wheat. A very specific request, a very specific way of begging, can you spare me some wheat? Now, there was only one person at home at the time, one person in the farm, and that was the farmer's wife. And as it was the start of the harvest, they had very little wheat there yet. But she did not refuse, Beth, and a very, very key point of this story, she did not refuse. She quite honestly explained there wasn't any there at the time, but to quote, she said... Perhaps, Bethan, you will call in a few weeks. We really cannot spare any at this time. So it wasn't a no, but it was a, a delayed gift of wheat. Let us get on with the harvest, pop back in a week or two, then you can have some wheat. Now, as I stressed, this was not a refusal, but nevertheless, we are told it was enough to enrage the witch. And just very quickly, I'm going to cut in here and say that throughout this story, Bethan is referred to as a witch. And while she might well have been a witch, she might not have been a witch. 
But in the original tale, she is certainly referred to as, and if I slip up and I forget to say supposed or accused witch, it's it's simply because I am referring to the text. Now, anyway, this, this witch, if she was one, was enraged as a result. It wasn't a refusal, but she was enraged and she stamped off down the path muttering. So no stereotypical witchy activity yet, She did not fly off on a broomstick or wave a magic wand or any of that stuff. She merely went off muttering under her breath and left the farmer's wife feeling very uneasy and worried. So much so that when her husband arrived home, when the farmer arrived home, she told him all about it and asked him, will she curse me, do you think? To which he replied, and these are direct quotes, this isn't me trying to sound like a Welsh farmer from the old days. Never mind stereotypical witches. We've also got stereotypical Welsh farmers. But he says, why no Bach? With Bach being a term of endearment in the Welsh language, literally it translates as small. But in this case, it's like deer, he's saying. Why no deer? And of course, Bach is also the name of a Baroque-era German composer, but that really would be going off on a tangent. So, anyway, why no, Bach? You did not really refuse her, did you now? Do not worry. She will not harm you. As far as the farmer is concerned, as far as her husband is concerned, nothing to worry about. She did nothing wrong. All she said was, come back in a few weeks, and it did the trick. It cheered up his wife considerably, we are told. And the witch, like that, disappeared from her mind. No more dwelling on Beth and Jones and these potential imaginary curses. All was well in the world once more. Well, for a week it was, anyway. Because a week later, they went to Llan Idlois Market. And who did they bump into? Who crossed their paths ominously? crossed their paths, none other than Beth and Jones, the apparent witch. Now, the farmer himself, he had had no crosswords with his neighbour. He spoke to Beth and, as he would have spoken to her on any other occasion. Friendly, well, I, I don't know if they were friends, but, you know, they certainly had no quarrel. The farmer and Beth and spoke. The wife, however, did not. We are told she suddenly became very scared and was unable to speak to her. In fact, she was not feeling well at all. She had this sense of foreboding that there was evil in the air. There was evil all around and she was frozen in fright. She drew her tattered old Welsh shawl around her, which is a lovely image, and if you don't know what an old Welsh shawl would have looked like, it was, or still is, made of wool. It was flannel. This is, I I try not to go off on the tangents, but this is Wales's big contribution to the Seattle grunge movement, is that flannel was invented in Wales and used in these shawls before it got picked up by lumberjacks and mud honey and people. But if you can imagine this shawl, and really the best thing to do would be to have an internet search for a Welsh shawl, and there is one painting, a wonderful painting out there, which I won't talk about too much now because I do want to dedicate an entire episode to it in the future, but it's a painting called Salem by an artist called Sidney Kerno Vosper. And yes, that is Salem, S-A-L-E-M, as in the infamous witch trials in Salem in America. But in this case, it does refer to Salem in Wales, but it's quite appropriate that we are talking about witchcraft on this episode. And it shows a lady called Sean Owen wearing this shawl. And there is something very peculiar, very evil about this shawl. And if you'd like to look at that picture and try and work out what exactly is evil about it in the meantime, please do. But I'll move on now. I'll say no more for now. I don't want to spoil the surprise when it does come. But have a look at that pic if you can, and we will discuss that in the future. Now, she pulled this shawl around her, 
and the witch gave a sardonic chuckle and shambled off. Maybe it sounded a bit like... (laughs) Yes, any excuse to put a sound effect in. And it has been a while. I've been a bit lazy with my sound effects recently, so let's get one back in here. Here's certainly a witch's chuckle. Does it... Is that a sardonic chuckle? I don't... I'm not entirely sure what a sardonic chuckle sounds like. Let, let's assume it is a sardonic chuckle. And with that, Bethan shambled off. <laughs> now, the farmer's wife had been feeling pretty good for that week in between, but things were about to go downhill rapidly. It was said that the farmer's wife had a reputation for being one of the best butter and cheese makers in Mid Wales, as it's referred to, but this skill had deserted her. Like that, her milk and cheese making powers had gone. The milk would not churn, although she tried hard, And finally, the maid servant had to churn it. She had to delegate the work to somebody who would not mess it up. Somebody who who was not, presumably, cursed as she was. Now, this didn't fool the family. They could tell straight away this didn't taste right. Not, Not necessarily bad, but this wasn't the same cheese and milk they were used to. And what's more, it carried on into the cooking itself. We are told her cooking skills failed. The bread did not rise. And possibly worst of all for a good, hard-working Welsh farmer's wife, the cowl was salty and the meat tasted half-cooked. And cowl, for those of you who aren't familiar, is it's a kind of traditional Welsh broth a delicacy in Wales, although it's something that was on the menu quite a lot when I was in uh, Welsh language school growing up. We'd we'd always have cowl for some reason. Maybe it was a, a patriotic dinner person cooking the stuff. But anyway, as with the shawl, you are better off doing an internet search for a look rather than listening to me trying to describe it badly. The important thing for the purposes of this story is that her cooking powers had gone, her cowl tasted badly, and as a result, she was hysterical. Her husband, the farmer, tried to calm her, but really, he was getting a bit worried, and told her to rest and to delegate and share out her duties between her two daughters. So all of this work she used to do was now being done either by the servant or by her two daughters. But rather than help her revive, rather than give her time to relax, it seemed to have the opposite effect. Her health began to fail and she became very depressed and weak. She began to lose her memory. And to quote, this is quite a colourful way of describing her condition. At 50, she showed all the symptoms of going senile. The local doctor could not bring about a change in her condition which baffled him. So that really did escalate quite quickly. From that little chuckle from a witch on the way or on the way home from Llan Idlois Market, now she had lost all her cooking skills and her food making skills, her homekeeping skills. She was depressed. She was weak. She lost her memory to the extent that we are told she was going senile long before she should be going senile and the doctor was left baffled. As a result, her husband was naturally in despair and he racked his brains for a solution. I mean, what what do you do if you think a witch has cursed your wife, or at least she believes she's been cursed by a witch. How do you solve that? Well, in this case, you turn to a wizard. It's the obvious choice, I guess, isn't it? The husband turns to a wizard who lived in Clan Edlois, who also lived in Clan Edlois. Clan Edlois was, or maybe it still is, but was certainly the magical place to be. And if I was in charge of tourism... Maybe it's lucky I'm not, but that would be on the welcome sign. Welcome to Magical. 
Plan Edlois. Home to witches and wizards and all sorts of magical stuff. Like it's like it's like the Welsh Hogwarts. Come along. To, well, actually, no, that's somewhere else. But anyway, it's still a lovely, lovely place. But moving on. So the farmer called on the services of a wizard or a wise man, as he's also described. And at the farmer's request, the wise man paid a visit to see the farmer's wife. And he pretty much confirmed what everyone else suspected. He said that, yes, she is under a curse. Not just a wizard, but a detective. Thank you, Sherlock. She is under a curse. But maybe his super sleuth skills weren't that great after all, because he had a few questions about this Beth Ann Jones that he wanted to ask the farmer's wife. But all she could say again and again and again in reply was, I am bewitched. So whether she really was cursed or not, who knows? But she certainly believed that she was bewitched. Now, having failed to get anywhere with the wizard, the farmer now turns to the witch, the supposed witch, herself. Now, Bethan refused to admit she had put a spell on his wife. Maybe that's just the kind of thing a stereotypical evil old witch would say. No, no, nothing to do with me. Or maybe... She was telling the truth. Maybe it was nothing to do with her. Maybe it was all in the farmer's wife's mind. Or maybe it was a bit of both. Maybe, yes, she was a witch, but not the kind of evil witch that goes around cursing people who don't give them free wheat. Whatever the truth was, she refused or she could not help. And the days went by And the farmer's wife, we are told, was by then lucid. She became weaker and weaker. And this is where our story reaches its crescendo, its dark ending. And I did mention briefly at the start that this story is a tragic tale, a very tragic tale. Certainly, I mean, I don't I don't know how true this is. It's it's reported as being true. If indeed it is a true story, it is a a truly horrific ending. But it was one fine sunny morning when the farmer's wife was sitting in the kitchen doing next to nothing, partly because it was her daughters doing all of the hard work now out in the dairy and places, partly because she was incapable of doing anything. She sat there pretty much motionless in the kitchen when a shadow came between the woman and the sunlight which was pouring through the open door presumably that's the kitchen door leading to the outside this this sudden shadow this darkness descended darkened the whole doorway to which the farmer's wife said aloud oh god death has come to get me And she heard a voice, a snarling voice in reply say, no, just old Bethan, whose magic is greater than the wise man of Llan Idlois. In other words, I know what you've been up to, or I know what your husband has been up to. There's no point trying to look for assistance. There's no point trying to get wizards or wise men or anyone else to come and save the day. It is not going to work. There is only one person who can save you now, and that person is Bethan Jones. And she is in no mood to do anything to help your plight. To quote once more, this voice of Beth and booming from the darkness says, No death for you, woman, by my hand. And I'll repeat that quickly. No death for you, woman, by my hand. So what she's saying is, she is not going to kill this woman. She is simply going to make her life a living hell. And she continues by saying, I am glad 
my magic is working so well. Farewell, we shall not meet again. And with yet another horrible chuckle, she vanished, or seemingly vanished, into thin air. Later that afternoon, the farmer's wife's body was found hanging from a beam in her bedroom. And so, while the voice of the witch, the supposed witch, if indeed it had been her voice, bear in mind this could have all been in the farmer's wife's mind, but had that really been the voice of Beth and Jones, then yes, she was correct. She did not take the farmer's wife's life with her own hand. Rather, she made her life so unbearable that she did it herself. And... In an epilogue to that story, there is no there is no victor, there is no winner in this tale. We are told Bethan left her home. She fled quickly, fearing the vengeance of the villagers. You can just picture almost like a scene from Frankenstein. The villagers gathered with pitchforks and torches to get the witch who would surely blame her for the farmer's wife's suicide. Which does beg the question... Had Bethan really been a witch? Or even if she was, had she cursed the farmer's wife? Surely she would have known. With her reputation, everyone knew the stories about Bethan Jones. She would be the obvious first culprit, the obvious target. Why would she wreck her own life in such a way at the same time? As with many of these tales, there were more questions than answers really and as always if you have any thoughts any ideas on this if you are a better sleuth than the wise man than the wizard of Llan Idlois it's always great to hear from people and I'm quite easy to track down on social media if you'd like to say hello and as mentioned I've spoken about a few of Jane's ghost stories in the past although technically episode 34 Witchcraft by the Sea was another of Jane's tales, but one which was included in a ghost book. But I think that's that's both. That's witches and ghosts. But it's usually ghosts when we look at Jane's tales. But this is the first witchy one, and there are quite a few more on the way as well. So if you don't want to miss any of the future witch episodes or ghost episodes or wizard episodes or whatever the heck I surprise you with and surprise myself with... Be sure to hit the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever. And after finishing on such a downer, I promise you next week's episode is going to be laugh a minute. I'm going to find the funniest topic in Welsh folklore I can. Nothing but non-stop hilarity or certainly it can't be any any more downbeat than that one can it let's see let's see what i come up with and it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening dioch and var iawn am grando i've been mark reese this has been my ghosts and folklore podcast it's the best it's the beautiful it's the only ghosts and folklore podcast beaming to you from wales to the world until next time, no star.